Good morning. And good morning to all those worshiping with us who aren't here, visiting with us over Facebook or over YouTube. And it's good that we can come as God's people to worship him wherever we are. And we pray that this morning he may speak to us through his word and that we may be drawn closer to him. For our call to worship this morning, um, for those not with us, um, our projector here isn't working, so our screen isn't uh, be giving us anything, but you'll still be able to, to see me and see those who will be singing. But um, for our call to worship, it comes to us from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forever. And we begin our worship this morning by turning to number 92 in our hymn books, Oh How I Love Jesus. Our God greets us this morning in these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his only Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, amen. And our God, having greeted us, let's greet each other. Um, good morning, everybody. <laughs> no, I don't take one. At this time, we'll be led in praise songs, but they won't be projected for us, so we're going to kind of have, the ladies can do them, and we're going to kind of have to do it by heart.
One day when heaven was filled with His praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men by example. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Risen from the dead, and 
eyes when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. There's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will Thank you, ladies, for leading us in song this morning. Whenever I hear that song, I will rise. I, I'm always reminded of Pastor Kevin Carhoff from Mitchell. He was the youth pastor there a few years ago, and he died of cancer in his 40s. But going to his funeral, uh, Pastor Dean Almer said that was his favorite song. And if you knew Kevin, um, Kevin was a little bit shorter than I, but bigger. And um, Pastor Dean said, singing that song in front of the congregation, he said he would have his hands up and he said the whole pulpit area would shake. He said he would get into it and start bouncing as he sang that song. And I can only imagine what Kevin and all those who've gone before us, how they're celebrating today, because Jesus came and he died, but he rose again so we can have eternal life. And we have nothing to fear. For our guide for living this morning, I was going to have a responsive reading of the law, but since we don't have projection, it would be hard for you to respond. 
So I'm just going to, to read the law for us this morning as it comes to us from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that, it may, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He responded by saying, the first and greatest commandment is this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. And it's easy for us to read the words, but much harder for us to put them into practice. And each of us realizes We've all sinned. We've all fallen far short of what God calls us to be. And yet Jesus says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We're blessed to have a God who loves us much more than we deserve. Shall we go to that God in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are our God. A God who's called us to be your people. A God who loves us much more than we deserve. A God who loves us so much you sent your one and only Son into this world to suffer a cruel death on our behalf so that we might be your children, so that we might have an eternal inheritance with you. Lord, we're humbled. We're humbled at your love for us. Help us to be the people you call us to be, people who love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and people who love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who are struggling on this day. For those who are lonely, we remember those who are aged, those in the nursing homes, in assisted living, those who would desire company, and yet in this time, company doesn't come. Lord, we pray that you will be near to them and give them the assurance that you are with them. We pray too, Lord, that you will be with those who are sick, those who are dealing with severe health problems, Lord, we pray that you will especially be with Laverne Vanderwerf, and we ask that you will bless her. We thank you that you've restored her health to some degree, and we pray that you'll continue to bless her. We pray, too, that you will be with those who are 
dealing with this virus, for those who are sick, for those who are ministering to those who are sick, for the doctors and nurses and aides, Lord, we ask that you will bless them and protect them. We ask too, Lord, that you will be with our nation, that you will be with our president, with our leaders. We ask that you will give them wisdom and discernment. Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we confess, Lord, as a nation, we've sinned. We've not put you first. We've tried to go our own way. Lord, we ask that you will give mercy and forgive, but that you will draw your people back to you, that we may follow you as we should. We pray that you will be with all the nations of the world. Lord, all over the world, people are struggling. And we pray, Lord, that as your word goes out, it will touch the hearts and minds of many, and that people may turn to you and worship you, and that they may see that their source of life and their source of eternal life comes from you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, and we pray that as it goes out in many places over many airwaves, that it will touch the hearts of those who hear it and that people may turn to you, and that you may be glorified in all the earth. Lord, we ask that you will be with us now as we continue to worship. We pray that you will bless those who aren't able to come, even though they would desire to do so. Lord, I pray that you will be with, be with Oakley, and that you will bless his leg that it may heal, and that he may be able to enjoy life again. We pray that it may grow right and that he may, it may develop the way it should. Lord, we're humbled at how frail our bodies are. But we marvel, we marvel at your greatness and how you knit us together perfectly. Lord, help us, each one of us, to be the people you call us to be. People who love you with all our hearts and that we share that as we live with those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'll be favored by special music as Mary Ann will be giving special music for us.
Thank you, Marianne. And it's a good reminder that no matter what we do, God still loves us. And he treats us far better than we deserve. Um, for our children's message this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, um, I didn't know who Marianne was going to ask um, to have sing. I asked her to take care of the praise songs. And so she asked you, and you get to be kids this morning, and um, is school a little bit challenging, Isabella? Yeah. A little bit, a little bit. Um, do you always get everything turned in right when you should? <laughs> <laughs> you do? Well, good, I'm glad. Is it a bit challenging for you, Nadia, as a teacher? Um, yeah. Um, sometimes we forget how blessed we are. Um, but I, I'm going to have you kind of go to school this morning because I've, I've got a test for you. Um, I'm going to give you a number, and I want you to remember the number. The number is 6,057,242,716. You got it? I'll, I'll say it again. Six. Six billion, fifty-seven million, two hundred and forty-two thousand, seven hundred and sixty. You all got it. Okay. You know, um, sometimes it's you, we can hear something and we think we're going to remember it. I have that. I go to town and my wife says, "Pick this up," and I get in the store and. I'm going to get it. And all of a sudden, what did she tell me? And I can't remember. It's easy to forget when we get distracted, you know. And I love doing children's messages, and I really didn't have that much, but I had a bunch of leftover candy canes. And when you think of candy canes, what do you think of? Christmas. Yeah, we think of Christmas. Um, candy canes are really a symbol of Christmas. Um, and they're a treat. We remember that Jesus, the the candy cane makes the letter J, and it has the shepherd's hook. The shepherds came and worshipped Jesus. And if we have the right ones, they have little red lines. We remember Jesus was scourged, and it has a dark red line. He bled for us, and a white line. But they come in all different colors. He makes us pure. They come in all different colors. And we as different people come in all different colors too. And we remember that Jesus came for all of us. And all of our, our candy canes, really, and all of our lives, point to Jesus, the God who gives us our life. And so I brought something this morning that's a little bigger than I usually give out for a children's message. Um, but Isabella, um, there's a big candy cane. Uh, and... and we're reminded that Jesus is bigger than anything in life. And if we focus on him, it makes all of our life come together. And Nadia, you have some kids you can take candy canes home to. Yes, take plenty of them. And Angela, you have... 
and you're going to have to share licks with your <laughs> with the, with your siblings. So, yeah. Um, by the way, can you remember that number I gave you? You got it. Six you were right, it was 16. You were very close. 716. And there would actually be an easier way to remember that number. Because if you break it down, it's 605 724 2716. The telephone number here at Grandview Reformed Church. And once you get things like that memorized, it stays with you. And it's good for us to get God's word memorized in our heart so it never leaves us. And we always remember that he loves us more than we deserve. So enjoy your candy canes, but enjoy life, remembering that we are loved by Jesus. For our scripture this morning, we turn to, first of all, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll read verses 4 through 12. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat, and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then we turn also to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24, and we'll read first of all the first eight verses, and then verses 13 through 35. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then they remembered his words. And we turn to verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, 
Are you only a visitor in Jerusalem? And do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord, and may God add his blessing to it. It's said that when a person nears the end of their life, it's then they talk about what is most important to them. I remember my mom saying that her dad, my grandpa Lafers, on his deathbed, one of the last things he said to her was, do you know how to make a mustard plaster? He was concerned about his grandkids. Back then they didn't have the medicine that we have today. And he was concerned if they got sick, if they got pneumonia, that if she didn't know how to make a mustard plaster as he had taught her, that his grandchildren would die a premature death. He wanted to make sure she knew. I could say when my dad was on his deathbed, he was taken to Sioux Falls Hospital and we went there on a Sunday. And his kidneys had quit working, they put him on dialysis and he wasn't expected to live that long. And I went there to say goodbye to him. And our family had gathered there, and I walked up to the bed. I was probably about 38 years old. He said, there's my little boy. There's my little boy. And for years, farming was on his mind. And he was always asking how the farm was going. That day, he never mentioned the farm. He said... I enjoy listening to you speak. He'd only heard me probably two, three times speak. He said, keep doing that. And he ended up living about three months longer. And we went to see him then in a nursing home in Mitchell. 
and he had quit having dialysis. They had thought that he would die shortly after, but he lived about seven weeks longer. But I went, went to see him one evening, and Dad loved to sing. And we asked him, is there a song you would like us to sing? And he said, Jesus is all the world to me. The farm didn't matter. His finances that he enjoyed doing didn't matter. Jesus meant everything to him, and he wanted to make sure his grandkids and kids knew Jesus. As we look at the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is nearing the end of his life. Miriam and Aaron have passed away. And Moses again asks the Lord, is it possible for me to go into the promised land that I've looked forward to? And God told him, no, you don't need to worry about that. I'll go with the people. You bless Joshua, and Joshua will go with them. But Moses is concerned about the people. And he writes the book of Deuteronomy. And he sums up everything that they've been through for the last 40 years. And he repeats many things to them. And he gives them the law again in Deuteronomy 5. He gives them the Ten Commandments. He repeats it to them. And then he tells the people, remember. Remember what you've been told to do. And throughout Deuteronomy, he says it over and over again. Remember, do not forget he says, bind these words on your children's forehead, on their hands. Tie them on the door frames of your houses. That they know who they are, where they came from. Your children will easily forget that you were brought out of Egypt, out of slavery. That God performed the ten plagues on the people in Egypt. And that he led you through the Red Sea on dry ground that he provided water and food for you for 40 years. Your sandals didn't wear out. Remember. Remember. Because when you get to the promised land and you are blessed, blessed far more than you deserve, with houses you didn't build, wells you didn't dig, Vineyards you didn't plant with luscious fruit. Don't become proud. But remember that it was God who brought you there. Why? Why did Moses write the book of Deuteronomy? Why was he so intent on putting that in the people's hearts? Because he loved these people. Remember he had said, Lord, rather than wipe them out, take me. Banish me for eternity. But spare these people for your name's sake. And so he reminds these people, God has been good. God has been faithful to you even when you forgot him. And the people forgot him over and over again. And yet God would bring them back. When they grumbled and complained against Moses, their leader, when they grumbled and complained that they would have better off in Egypt, God would remind them and bring them back. See, Moses knew. Moses knew that they could easily forget God again. When they got to the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land with large grapes, the land with riches, it would be easy to forget. And sometimes we too forget. We forget how blessed we are. Jesus' disciples Jesus' disciples, the ones who had been with him for three years, could easily forget, too, when they saw Jesus do many miracles. 
He healed the sick. He made the lame walk. Made the blind see. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 with just five loaves and two fishes. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He shut up the religious leaders. And they were focused on Jesus. On Jesus being with them. On Jesus restoring the people of Israel, overthrowing Rome. And when Jesus died, when Jesus died, they were devastated. The women who loved him more than anything went to the tomb to put spices on his body. They were focusing on their loss. But when they got to the tomb, the tomb was, the stone was rolled away, the stone the tomb was empty, Jesus' body was gone, and they could only think, where did he go? Who stole his body? And it wasn't until they saw two angels in clothes, it says as bright as lightning. Can you imagine having lightning flash in front of your face? And they fell down on their knees, fearing death. And the angels said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why do you search for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen just as he said. Don't you remember? He said he would have to suffer and die in three days, be raised again. See, Jesus had told them that. But they were so focused on him being with them and delivering Israel that they forgot. They kind of blotted that out of their minds. And it took the angels in front of them to remind them. They went and told the disciples. And we too often forget why Jesus came. Jesus appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem. It's probably about a three and a half miles. Some people think it was seven but it was probably up and back with seven. But it was probably about three and a half miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And Jesus walks that road. It'd be kind of like walking from here to Highway 44. And Jesus walks along with them and talks with them. And he hears their conversation and he asks them what they were talking about. And they said, don't you know? You must be a visitor from not around here. Jesus was well known. He came and he healed the sick. He did many miracles. But our religious leaders crucified him. But we're puzzled. We're puzzled because these women went to the tomb and they didn't find his body. And they tell the story of angels. And and the disciples too went to the tomb and didn't find his body. And we're puzzled as to what has happened here. And Jesus starts to talk with them. And he says, how foolish you are. Don't you know? Don't you know what it says in the good book? That Jesus must come and die. And he goes through all the scriptures. We imagine first from the book of Genesis 3.15 where the son must be crushed. That he would be, have his, be bruised for our transgressions. But he would crush the serpent's head from the time of man's fall into sin. God promised a Savior. Perhaps he told them about the story that we looked at a few weeks ago about the people of Israel grumbling and complaining and the snakes coming out to bite the people and God tells Moses to take a serpent and put it on the pole so people could look to the snake and be healed. And Jesus would be like that serpent. Everyone who looks to him who died on the cross can be healed of our sins. Perhaps he told them what Psalm 
22, where David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he basically goes through Jesus' death where they divided my garments. And it all points to the Son of David, Jesus Christ, who would come and give up everything for us. Perhaps he pointed out to them Isaiah 53, where he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. With his stripes we are healed. Jesus pointed to them that he had to suffer and die. He had to suffer and die. Why? It wasn't because we are so good. It wasn't because they were so good. It's because of our sins. See, you and I, you and I are often much like the Israelites. We're often much like the disciples. We have a focus in life. And we've been taught. We've been taught as little children songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We've been taught, oh, be careful. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down and be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little hands, what you do. We've been taught Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yet we often forget to follow. We've been taught, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. We've been taught the Heidelberg Catechism. My only comfort in life and in death is that I'm not my own, but I belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet, yet we often forget. See, we, like the Israelites, have kind of been brought to the promised land. Pilgrims came to this country and settled it. Many of them died, giving up their lives for their ancestors, for you and for me. We've had soldiers who fought defending the freedom of our land. Most of us have not. We've had settlers who came to this part of the country and lived in shacks with their families as they settled the land which we now enjoy. They did it with little medicine and much faith. They were set on living life. Living life to the fullest and passing it on to the next generation. See, often we forget. We forget what Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. I'm reminded... I'm reminded of the words of Kim Kroll. She said so often, I pray the prayer. But in my heart, I'm really saying, not thy will, but mine be done. We often like to have it our way. And we as people can become so focused on this life that we forget. We forget we're not here to live forever. We forget why Jesus came. Yesterday, I must confess, I'm having a bit a hard time with this social distancing thing. And Beth went and had some things. She said, maybe you can pass them out to some shut-ins who are feeling a bit lonely. And I went to a lady and I brought her a loaf of bread and a rose. And she stood at the door and she said, you want to come in? Well, I said, um, I have no problem, but I said, I don't want to um, 
offend your family knowing she came from a medical family or, or you, I said. I have no problem with it, she said, but for their sakes, can we sit outside? So we sat down on two chairs about six feet apart, and we visited. And as we visited, she said, I'm not scared of this virus. I'm 90 years old, but I'm not afraid of it. Um, she said, God's been with me this whole time. But she said, I am concerned about my family. I'm concerned about my kids and my grandkids. She said, I was taught very strictly the Heidelberg Catechism. I was taught God's word. And she said, that's in me. I'm not so sure that that has got passed down to my kids and grandkids the way I learned it. And she said, yet I have this confidence. I have this confidence not that I'm going to live forever, because I know I'm not. She said, not that this nation is going to survive. See, many are scared what our nation is going to become. But we're reminded Jesus didn't come to build the nation of the United States or any other nation. He came to build a kingdom, the kingdom of God, that you and I as people might trust in him for life and for eternity. And as I visited with her, she would always recall to me the Heidelberg Catechism. What do people really need to know to enjoy life? First, how great our sins and miseries are. Christ came not because we were so good, but because we were sinners. Second, that Christ came. That Christ came, he loved us so much he gave his life for us. Third, that having realized that we are to live thankful lives, she trusted in Jesus. That she could live eternal life no matter what might come because of Jesus Christ. It was what was most important to her. I won't say her name just because her kids may be watching. But she said, as I was going to leave, she said, thank you very much for coming to see me. She said, I'm going to shake your hand and I'm going to give you a hug. I said, okay. How blessed we are. How blessed we are to have a God who loves us more than we deserve. We don't need to be afraid. May each of us trust only in him. It is he who gives us life and eternal life. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this day. And Lord, we confess we often forget. We often worry about things that really are in your hands. We often forget that you died so we can live. We forget how much we're loved by you. Lord, may your people today be able to focus on you and what you've done for us. May we take confidence in you alone, the one who gives life the one who gives eternal life. And may we say that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's on him we hang our lives. Amen. And now shall we stand and profess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we can give our offerings here, or you can mail them to, to Matt DeWard for the people in Harrison. You can mail them to Seth Reimnitz. And we'll sing together number 463, verses 1 and 3 through 5 of I Will Remember Thee. morning and we thank you for blessing us far more than we need or deserve help us to remember that all that we have is a gift from you entrusted to our care for a little while we thank you for an opportunity to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with and we ask that you will multiply it that you will use it for your purposes that you will use it for the coming of your kingdom that you will use it to bring men and women, boys and girls, to a faith and trust in you, that you might be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our benediction this morning, we turn to the book that's considered the book of faith, Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses, where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. 
For our closing song, we'll sing number nine in our hymn books, Glorify Thy Name. church for allowing me at least 10 people. Um, I've heard of stories where they set up stuffed animals in the pews. You guys respond much better. Uh, Maybe I go a little too long because of it, but thank you for joining and worshiping that you could be a blessing to others. And may each of us be a blessing to others in this week, remembering how much we are loved by Jesus. Go in peace.